This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with David Andolfato. He is uh, he's a professor of economics at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And he's also a VP of research at the St. Louis Fed. So this is the first time that we are joined by a, a proper real life central banker. And um, as uh, you know, we, we talk so much about money and about how money should work and all those things. And uh, I think it's, it's something that most people in the Bitcoin space don't know that much about how it like sort of works deep underneath. So I'm super excited that uh, David's joining us today. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and I guess the, the reason why we sort of come to this is because you've written a blog post called FedCoin and then you've also given a, a few lectures on the topic, basically exploring the question what it would be like and how a, a federal government or a federal bank could issue their own cryptocurrency because it's, it's sort of an obvious idea, but it's also really interesting to think through all the implications. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess uh, there's, uh, you know, we, we have to also kind of uh, define, I suppose, what we mean by cryptocurrency. I mean, central banks and, and other banks already issue kind of virtual currencies yeah, and and the, the, the question really is what sort of properties do you want to, uh, you know, uh, surround that currency with? Uh, in the very extreme, uh, I proposed uh, 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 the idea that I, I saw J.P. Koning uh, uh, present once on a blog post called FedCoin. So the, the idea was not mine, uh, but I took it to the natural limit. Like suppose, uh, you know, we actually had the, the Federal Reserve Bank issuing a cryptocurrency that was uh, actually... Uh, where the payments were actually pro processed by Bitcoin miners. I, I entertained that possibility as, as kind of an extreme. Yeah, no, I think that's a fascinating one. But maybe before we, well, I, I, let's, let's start with that question. Like, how long have you been interested in Bitcoin, curious about it, or do you remember how you first heard about it? Well, um, you know, I've, I've always had an eye on the payment system, kind of just from a theoretical uh, level. As, 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 by way of background, I'm, I'm an academic, I'm a macroeconomist, so I, I, I actually don't have very much uh, uh, detailed knowledge of the, the, the actual plumbing of the way the uh, payment system works. But I've always, you know, I've, I've likened the payment system to kind of like the circulatory system. It's like when it's working fairly well, nobody notices this, you know, you're circulatory process in your body but it, I mean, when, when things screw up <laughs> that's when you really uh, you find out uh, the, the potential problems so I guess I I, I, I I got a heightened interest in the in the payment system during the financial crisis and at about that time is when Bitcoin kind of came around and I had my eye on it but more of I didn't understand it I, did, I thought it was kind of like a a, a crazy sort of idea. You always see these kind of crazy ideas out there. Uh, but then uh, Marcella Williams, who uh, was in my department, asked me if I would like to uh, kind of speak on the subject because uh, there seemed to be a growing interest in it. And uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has this very, very, uh, I think, nice program. It's called Dialogue with the Fed, where we give public lectures on topics that, uh, that uh, are of, of public interest. And that's about a year, when was it, March, March 31st of 2014 is when I gave that public lecture. So I began to research Bitcoin kind of quite, quite intensively at the beginning of 2014, so just over a year ago. Cool. And uh, what, were your, what were your thoughts about Bitcoin, your first thoughts from, a, from the perspective of a monetary economist? Well, I mean... It's, it's the type of faults are very easy to come by because of just the language that people use to describe things. So, for example, uh, mining is, is something that kind of confuses economists. I mean, 
you're immediately, uh, you know, <laughs> Paul Krugman uh, famously made the same mistake. And it's quite natural because people call a process mining. And it's like you have this vision of actually just this digital gold and you're out there mining it. And, and, and as you know, I mean, mining is not... <laughs> is not an accurate description of what 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 is the purpose of of the miners and so you know in in the in the in the classical theory i mean we know there's these well-known theorems of the inefficiency of commodity money the inefficiency of mining i mean why why do we exert effort into extracting yellow metal from the ground or, or silver metal and, and just to store it again underground say in port knox i mean it just doesn't make sense and and it's very very easy to get kind of if you don't if you don't kind of read up uh, uh, on it, it's very easy to be uh, to be led astray and to have some misconce- misconceptions. Now, touching on Bitcoin, I, I I believe that it's your opinion that Bitcoin doesn't actually make a good store of value. Uh, it does have a good uh, an interesting payment system, but the store of value in your opinion um, necessarily isn't there. Uh, can you talk about what are um, what makes good money? Um. Yeah, so I, I think it's, a, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Bitcoin is not a good store of value. Um, I, I think that it could potentially be a, a good long run store of value. Um, so I, I, I make a distinction, uh, and I think a lot of monetary theorists do as well, on the short run rate of return versus the long run rate of return of an asset. And uh, of course, it's desirable if you could to have high long run rate of return and a high stable short run rate of return. But life is full of trade offs. So uh, my, my view would be more of, yeah, you know, I think as a store of value, if, I mean, if people wanted to put aside some, some uh, Bitcoin in their wealth portfolios, you know, not, not too much of it, that it might perform kind of in similar ways to, say, gold or something like that. And uh, that would be OK. But uh, there, there, there is a fixed supply of the stuff, and, and you know, you could imagine uh, with with demand growing that over the long run it might be a, a good store, a decent store of value. But uh, the, to, to be a good money, you know, a good money needs more than just that. I mean, it's good if it has a long run, good long run uh, store of value. But what's what's even uh, what's also important is that uh, it has a good short run rate of return. That, in other words, that the, its purchasing power doesn't fluctuate too dramatically in the short run, or um, or even if it if it does remain stable for a while, that it isn't subject to wild swings in its purchasing power, and um, I think it's a property of of these types of uh, monetary policies like the gold standard and and uh, and also Bitcoin, that uh, in times of in, in times of heightened um, demand for for uh, money, like during a financial crisis, you see these uh, these these very large increases in the demand for money. That if if the supply of money is fixed, that what's naturally going to happen is is that the purchasing power of that money is just going to skyrocket, which is is to say, uh, it'll create a huge deflationary event. And um, we know that these unexpected deflationary events uh, are, are very harmful because. Because, you know, most people organize their, their payments in terms of like nominal debt contracts. I mean, you pay the rent in, in so many dollars per month. I mean, you're paying your employees a certain amount of wage. Uh, and if, if, if firms see the product prices plummeting in a big deflation, they're going to have difficulty meeting these, uh, these nominal obligations. And they're going to have to lay off workers, renege on their debts. And, you know, this is, this is why... Um, this type of uh, Bitcoin, the monetary policy is not necessarily a good monetary policy from the, for, you know, relative to a well-designed kind of uh, uh, elastic monetary policy that would increase the supply of money uh, during a crisis to alleviate the, the pressure that there is on the demand for the money. And in doing so, you're, you're able to kind of smooth out the price level effect and, and kind of avoid the worst consequences of these unexpected deflationary events. That's basically... No, I mean, I think that makes complete sense, right? Also, there are some of these perhaps rather unlikely scenarios, but one can one can imagine that, right? Like, let's say Bitcoin was adopted by the world, became a new world currency or something, you know, it might happen. Uh, and, and of course, the consequence would be there would be an incredible increase in the value of Bitcoin. And there would be incredible uh, 
change in the wealth distribution, like a shift in how the wealth is distributed and all those things. And, and it's pretty obvious that those would be incredibly disruptive events. Uh, maybe some good consequences and some bad consequences, but in any case, like really, really disruptive. So, I mean, I think it makes sense that, you know, when you say that, that, that this inability, which I guess in Bitcoin case is also a feature, right? But to, to adjust the money supply is, um, you know, has its downsides in some scenarios. Yeah, uh, the disruptiveness of, of, of these events, though, as, as, as you know, in, in, the, in the best case scenario for Bitcoin advocates, as it becomes uh, uh, widely adopted, I mean, it'll be disruptive. But, uh, you know, the, the key thing is, so it's it's not not necessarily going to be uh, something that just happens overnight. I mean, these that sort of disruption can be kind of more or less forecast, and 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 people can adapt to it. The type of a disruption I'm talking about is, uh, you know, sub, well, sub, like the Great Depression. Yeah. So suppose Bitcoin does become the 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 the, the, the new you know the the numeraire, the, the the unit of account. Suppose that it is the base money, uh, that 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 money supply uh, as as in kind of like the goal centers is basically fixed. And uh, that's, that's, that's not best practice when it comes to, uh, to, to the conduct of monetary policy, at least according to a, you know, a, a wide body of, uh, of, of theory. Now, some have proposed, uh, I mean, it's been talked about that we would have uh, uh, some fork in Bitcoin at some point, some modification in Bitcoin, where we would integrate some monetary policy as, uh, as an automated part of how Bitcoin works. Um, do you feel that, do you think that at some point it would be possible in the current, sort of given the current state of Bitcoin, you know, a decentralized currency with no central bank, et cetera, do you think it's possible to have monetary policies integrated um, without uh, oversight by a central bank, essentially an automated uh, monetary policy? That, that's an excellent question, you know, and, and uh, it, the thought had occurred to me um, and and uh, I, I have seen people kind of kind of think about that idea, uh, and I, I haven't thought it through as much as I would have liked, unfortunately. But but here's the issue. I mean, my own feeling is, uh, yeah, I think that that that's possible, and it'd be interesting, right, if if such a fork were to occur, uh, and then and then of course these two these two types of currencies could coexist, and we could kind of see, you know, there'd be a competition. Uh, just as there would be a competition between the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin, there's a competition about uh, which type of monetary policy is kind of a, a dominant. Um, there is the question of, you know, how we could automate it. I mean, how, you, it'd have to be like a, you'd have to, uh, you know, write something into the program. Um, I think the challenge is, I mean, it would be very easy to write into the program uh, a rule that, for example, during a crisis, uh, you know, that could be measured by some publicly observable event, because to say the, the price level or something like that. I mean, you typically see the price level begins to plummet uh, in, in, a, in a crisis of deflation. You could program, uh, you know, a, a, a state contingent policy in the Bitcoin protocol to actually inject new Bitcoins into the system conditional on that event. That, that would be very easy. I mean, it would just say, you know, yeah. If the price level falls below this level, I mean, we're going to inject, you know, uh, one per, everybody's Bitcoin uh, balances are going to increase by 1%, something like that. I mean, you could, you could build that into the protocol very easily. Injecting the, the, uh, the cash would be easy. Um, I think that the, the, the problem, uh, the more challenging uh, uh, issue would be how do you withdraw that money after the crisis has passed? Yeah. Uh, um, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting to bring that up because we actually did a podcast episode on on Rob, with Robert Sams on okay. uh, his paper senior chairs, okay. and he he developed exactly a model to do that. Oh, okay. So, uh, I mean, we will have to link the show notes, but I can very very briefly sort of restate the idea. Like he had, there would be. I mean, the idea was that you have a stable. Uh, a stable currency, right? So that in case people more people want the currency. Uh, more coins get issued, right? And if if fewer people want the currency, then the coins get uh, coins get destroyed. So the question is, how, how do coins get destroyed? Right, is in right. particular, yeah. and uh, he would have there would be coin holders and sort of shareholders. So shareholders, you could think of like the owners of the the system, 
And uh, in the case of uh, where you need to destroy coins, essentially um, the, the shareholders can buy those. And, um, or no, the, the coin holders can destroy the coins and in return they get the shares, right? So in a way you have this, this sort of equilibrium that's between the two, uh, the two coins that I see. So, so like I said, I mean, uh, so I had I didn't think through that part of it very carefully, and it wouldn't surprise me that smart people like Robert, for example, and other people might come up with solutions to the problem. the The interesting part is, yeah, suppose you, you we do come up with a solution like that, and there's a fork. It'd be a very interesting experiment to see, uh, to, just to see how uh, how it performs. It'd yeah. Be interesting, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's much chance that that's going to happen with Bitcoin. But maybe <laughs> someone else is going to do uh, another currency, and it's 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 not without its complexity. Let's take a short break to talk about our sponsor, Ledger. Ledger are the makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet, a small, beautiful, simple device that lets you keep your Bitcoin safe without buying a Swiss bunker, without digging a hole in the basement, without uh, buying a data center defended by autonomous autonomous robots. None of these you need. All you need is a small device, lets you plug it into any computer, whether it's safe or not, and your private keys remain safe. So the nice thing about the Ledger is, is the wallet, which is really great to use. And by the way, there's a companion app also for iOS and Android, which allows you to do the second factor authentication required anytime you do a transaction. But you can also use Ledger with CoinKite. So if you have a CoinKite setup, uh, you can use Ledger as one of the private keys in that setup. For, so for instance, uh, if you're uh, just you know an individual and you want to secure your Bitcoins, you could have a multi-signature setup where CoinKite would have one key uh, and you would have another key and perhaps, I don't know, maybe like your girlfriend has another key. Or if you're a company, you know, you can also uh, have it set up so that you know, all the founders have keys and there's like an, a three out of five um, uh, keys required to sign. So there's, you know, the possibilities are endless and uh, that's made possible by the pa partnership between CoinKite and Ledger. So if you're interested in uh, trying Ledger out, you can go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 at checkout and that'll give you 10% off your first order. So don't delay in getting a secure setup today. And we'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So talking about Fedcoin, can you give a brief introduction about what the, the big idea is? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, none of, none of these ideas are kind of original to me. I mean, I, I was just remarking on, you know, uh, I, I gave a talk actually uh, in Frankfurt earlier this year and I actually prefaced my Fed, it was called FedCoin, but I prefaced the discussion on FedCoin with what I called FedWire for all, which is, is kind of an old idea. And the, the idea is, is basically why, why can't everybody, you, me, uh, and firms have, have direct accounts at the, at the central bank, uh, at the Fed? Um, and now, there's a number of reasons why we can't, but I mean, that's all kind of stuff that could, in, in principle, could be changed. Um, and if not direct accounts, why not uh, segregated accounts at, at, at private banks that are basically, you know, uh, segregated and constitute 100% backed uh, cash reserves with these accounts. So basically some form of narrow banking proposal, which is kind of an old idea. Uh, and I was just going, you know, I mean, that the, the present system that we have in place now is a system that's evolved over centuries based on, on pre-internet technology. You know, may, maybe there was even a reason or a rationale for why you didn't necessarily want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to have a personal service account at the Fed and why you might want to delegate this responsibility to private banks. Um, but, you know, in, in since the internet, which is, is still very, very uh, new, I mean, there's, there's, really, there's really no reason why people couldn't have a direct online account with the Fed. And, um, and I, 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 I was surprised to learn that in fact, in the United States, people are permitted to have direct online accounts with the US Treasury. <laughs> so I, I can go and open up an account directly online with the US Treasury. And what am I buying there? I, I, I'm buying, you know, electronic digits, interest-bearing electronic digits. 
And uh, now the treasury hasn't set up so that I can easily make payments across people within the system, but you know that's just a detail that could be very easily accomplished. And uh, and and if the treasury can do it, why can't the Fed do it? And just let you know, just let uh, you know uh, businesses directly deposit in an account with the Fed or or, or through some sort of a, a private bank that has a segregated account. And um, th there's some technical legal issues to overcome there, but they could be overcome. And uh, they could earn interest on, uh, directly, they could in earn interest on, on, on this, this money as well. I mean, they could be just like treasury bills, interest bearing uh, government money. Uh, they would be 100% uh, insured. There'd be no, no need for uh, FDIC or any sort of insurance like that because the Fed prints the money. I mean, there's, there's no issue of, of losing it. Uh, a lot of businesses today that, you know, who are, are managing their cash, uh, you know, they, they, they don't feel like they can deposit 50 or $100 million in banks because uh, the deposit insurance doesn't cover that much. They're, so that's why they're, they're motivated to go into the shadow banking sector and, and, and into the repo markets. And, and as we know, that was the, the shadow banking sector was the source of the, of the financial crisis uh, in 2007, 2008. So... I said, why, you know, in principle, kind of ignoring a bunch of details, why couldn't everybody just have a direct account with a Fed? Uh, you could trust the Fed to do the bookkeeping. We could, you know, the Fed is, people say, how can you trust, you know, the Fed to do the bookkeeping? I mean, I mean like I said, I, my response is, well, you don't expect the Fed to kind of steal your money. I mean, if the Fed, the Fed can print all the money at once, it's not going to like mess around <laughs> with your bookkeeping. So, you know, we have this, this big uh, spreadsheet, you know, the, the blockchain, if you want, but it's just managed by the Fed. And it's very cheap, much cheaper than Bitcoin, uh, if you're willing to delegate the responsibility to a, a, a third party. Um, and, and, but then the, the downsides to all of that, of course, is, is uh, you know, some, you know, you'd actually, suppose you, you didn't want the Fed to be... Uh, uh, responsible for processing the payments. I mean, suppose, you know, the, the Fed will likely impose some KYC restrictions on, on some purchases. They might not process some purchases that you might want to undertake. Um, and so it was at that point that I said, well, you know, we could, if we wanted to, extend the concept one step further. Uh, I'm not saying that this is ever going to happen, but just conceptually, you could imagine uh, not Fed wire for all, but kind of like a Fed coin, where what the Fed would do is actually just issue these, uh, you know, Bitcoin-like objects, but um, and and they would enforce a, a, a par exchange rate with the U.S. dollar that would eliminate the exchange rate volatility, uh, but they could delegate the the clearing of these payments to some third party, you know, some sort of Ripple-like protocol or, or possibly. Uh, a bit, even Bitcoin. I mean, we could delegate the responsibility of processing these these electronic, you know, Fedcoin payments to the miners. And, and the idea there would be, you know, because uh, we can't really expect the Fed to turn a blind eye to kind of certain types of transactions. Uh, the, in fact, the Fed does turn a blind eye to a lot of type of transactions already. Uh, those would be the type of transactions that are facilitated by the cash <laughs> that the Fed prints, right? So the, the Fed doesn't impose any KYC restrictions on cash payments. You know, we somehow, society somehow seem to uh, manage, you know, over the centuries to, uh, to, to not, not implode because of the availability of cash and, and kind of these uh, anonymous kind of uh, payments that leave no trail. So... To the extent that the Fed would be is, is already kind of comfortable, or, or for lack of a de better word, kind of willing to live with the fact that we already live in a world where these Fed liabilities are circulating to facilitate, uh, you know, anonymous or un underground exchanges. We are already living with this reality. Why don't we just issue a Fed coin and permit it to be cleared through these miners. And it's just kind of like the, the equivalent of what's happening with the cash we already, we print out. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is such a, a novel idea and there's so many, uh, there's so many topics that, uh, that we can cover on this. But so the KYC um, idea, so the, the idea that 
Okay, so it, currently in the cash system, there's no KYC. You can make these cash transactions without uh, any uh, the government knowing uh, where the money is going and what you're doing with the money. Uh, but you know the cash has certain limitations. So cash is hard to transport in large quantities uh, over borders, for instance. You can't pay uh, digitally with cash. And it, it seems to me that if the Fed or if there was some like government issued coin, that it, it's just so unlikely. It's just, it would be preposterous to think that the government would not uh, want to impose some sort of KYC on there because. You know, the implications of not having KYC are, I mean, think about uh, capital controls, for instance, or being, you know, being able to send like large amounts of money to countries where there are economic sanctions, like just that. Like, do, you, do you really think that governments would not impose KYC on, on like a proposed Fed coin? No, I, I, I think that quite, you're quite likely right. I mean, you know, but for that matter, you know, governments are kind of strange sometimes. I mean, for example, why, look at all the $100 bills that the Fed prints. I mean, I never see a hundred dollar bill. I mean, where are they? Where do they all go? I mean, yeah, as I mean, far yeah as I, similarly and, in, in Europe, we have these 200 and yeah. 500 euro bills, and I don't know where they go either. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> as far as I can tell, from what I'm reading, I mean, all these hundred dollar bills are like circulating over in, 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 in Russia or, you know, around the world. And it's quite clear, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there are some legitimate uses as well for $100 bills. I'm not saying that people who hold $100 bills are necessarily criminals, <laughs> but I'm just saying it, it's quite clear that, uh, you know, the Fed and uh, the authorities seem to be turning a blind eye to this fact. And, and in principle, uh, you know, uh, the other thing, though, is that you have to keep in mind that, um, you know, even on the blockchain, I mean, it's possible to you know, the IRS or the FBI, I mean, it's possible to do the forensics and kind of, and, and kind of trace where these payments are going, ultimately. I mean, I, I know there's all these games being played to kind of anonymize payments and all that. But uh, that's just the property of the blockchain. It's going to be there if it's with FedCoin or with just Bitcoin. This blockchain is public information. It's living out there. You're going to be able to trace payments one way or the other. I mean, people are going to uh, the authorities are going to design techniques to uh, trace payments somehow. The uh, uh, people in the, in the in the Bitcoin space will develop ways to get around it. There will be kind of this continual arms race. Um, so, yeah. I, so I, just to come back to what you say, yeah, I think you're right from a practical point of view. I think it's unlikely that uh, that the authorities would kind of really turn a blind eye to AML or KYC sort of concerns. But I'm just, I was just kind of throwing it out there as kind of, in principle, was kind of possible, and that it wouldn't really be that much that much different than kind of w what's happening today with cash. I mean, if if we sort of take the other perspective, so I mean, I, mean, I agree. I think this is a it's probably going to be a hard sell, right? But it, I mean, you could say one of the big political advantages and the reasons why the U.S. is such a strong country is because the U.S. dollar is like the the world's strongest currency, right? That in many countries that have very weak currencies, like, you know, a lot of Latin American countries and other countries, uh, you know, the dollar is a, like de facto, has a very important role that a lot of economic transactions are done uh, with the dollar. And that's despite the dollar being quite a pain to use there because, well, you only have the cash and, and you know, if you want to get it across the border, you may get caught and then there's all these things. But, well, if we imagine now a Fed coin, well, that, that's an entirely different thing, right? So sure. then you could, I, I think that would be extremely threatening to, to countries that have, uh, you know, terrible monetary policies. But at, on the, the flip side, it might also be really attractive for the U.S. in that it, it would solidify potentially its, its sort of position as this dominant world currency. No, I think that's that's absolutely correct. I mean, uh, there, you know, it, it would give the U.S. a great advantage in that sense. Uh, there, there are some pitfalls associated with with having your currency circulate globally, but on, on net, it's probably positive. And, and and this type of idea, this Fed coin idea, uh, is uh, is something that would just enhance the the attractiveness of the U.S. currency abroad and solidify its purchasing power. Uh, I, I think, um, 
but of course the 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 downside of of the program is of course that the people who use fedcoin or or, or fedwire for all uh, whatever the, the 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 case may be are are subjecting themselves to um, us monetary policy and uh you know, for the past 30 years, you, one could make the case that the U.S. monetary policy has been run uh, responsibly in the sense that uh, inflation is, is be, being low and stable. I, I know there's all sorts of critics out there about Fed policy, but uh, we could spend all day d- debating that. Uh, by and large, for the past 30 years, inflation has been low and stable. Uh, and, But of course, just because that's the case, uh, in recent history doesn't mean it always has to be the case. So people who would be using FedCoin, of course, are subjecting themselves to whatever political uncertainties might afflict the, the central banks, right? the U.S. Fed or, or, or yeah. other institutions. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that, that's certainly one thing that, for example, you know, it, it might even be the case, right, that the, you, the Fed coin would have a, a, a better monetary policy than Bitcoin, right? But that's perhaps some an aspect where Bitcoin would have an advantage because it's it's neutral in a way. Um, That's right, yeah. But e- even there, I, th- I think, you know, I mean, people use the US dollars today, right? And they are subject to US monetary policy. I think you could, it could probably still succeed there. But where I think if you do have to start imposing KYC, that's not going to work, right? Like having KYC on people in other countries and those kind of things, um, it, it, that you know, it will break down. I think at that point, you know, it, it, unless the Fed or a hypothetical central bank would really be willing to give up that control. Yeah, and I, I think that for myself, I think that uh, I mean, if I was in charge, I, I would give up that control, uh, especially over small transactions, right? I mean, you could actually con- condition the KYC. Uh, Specification. You could say transactions below a hundred dollars or whatever, a thousand dollars, whatever, the, whatever the parameter is, uh, whatever. Do what you want. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, and for for people who are concerned, who are just not going to trust the government currency, whatever. There's Bitcoin or there's other cryptocurrencies. I think that's great. I think it's it's fantastic that these alternatives uh, uh, coexist and, and meet the demands of. Uh, these people who want to maybe they're willing to live with the day-to-day volatility in the currency. They're they're comfortable with the idea over the long run the currency is going to maintain its value. Uh, it's they're not subject to these uh, KYC restrictions. I mean, go for it. That's that's fine. Uh, I think there's room for these uh, these currencies to coexist. So one important uh, Robert Sams wrote a post. We'll, we'll link to it in the show notes as well, uh, which I thought was very interesting in response to, to your post. And he, he sort of said, well, you and also uh, J.P. Koenig kind of maybe underestimated how, just how revolutionary this concept is. Because in his view, it would really undermine the very idea of fractional reserve banking in that it would make you know, deposits, holding deposits with banks really, really unattractive because everybody would want to hold Fed coins. So it would be a huge issue for, well, for the existing financial systems. Uh, what is your view on that? Yeah, well, this is, this is uh, uh, an interesting, uh, fascinating uh, subject for study. And so my views on, on this matter are, are not set in stone. They're, they're continually uh, evolving. Um, uh, but, so I noticed you mentioned FedCoin and not uh, Bitcoin. Is, is that what you meant, FedCoin? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess Bitcoin could have a similar effect, but that's, uh, I think, a much harder shot because it can't compete. Well, this, this is, this is quite an interesting. Uh, you know, it, it would definitely uh, impact to some extent on the on the on the, the incumbents in the banking sector. That's for sure. Um, but it wouldn't take away, uh, you know, their business in the sense of their lending arms. What they do. I mean, uh, banks. You know, in narrow banking systems, you kind of you're separating out the payments from the credit side of the economy. Banks could still go out and lend money. They could still make mortgages. They could still, uh, you know, finance, uh, uh, you know, uh, firms, small firms, inventory investment, or or whatever. Um, so so so. You know, um, 
I think that 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 part is uh, is is going to be very disruptive for for the incumbent banking sector. But you know, arguably for the benefit of society. Yeah. Um, but just let me jump in there. But wouldn't would that be the sort of banking system where? Because I, I can I, I don't think in my view it's possible to have a, a fractional reserve Bitcoin system. I mean, you can have people can run a, a closed sort of a, a closed fractional reserve like Mt. Gox is doing apparently, right? But then you can't use like Mt. Gox bitcoins to pay anywhere else. It's a closed system, and then as soon as people realize it and withdraw enough, like it breaks breaks apart. So wouldn't this work out in a similar way that you know, okay, maybe there would be banks that do lending, but then you know if they had. Uh, one billion in deposits from from depositors. Well, they could only actually lend out one billion in loans and not um, fifty billion with a fractional reserve system. It, you don't you think that would be the case? So no, <laughs> I've uh, I've uh, and uh, that's a kind of a provisional no. Because uh, I've actually been uh, corresponding with Robert Sams uh, uh, by email, and we've been discussing, uh, debating the issue. And so I, I'm familiar with uh, Robert's uh, assertion that fractional reserve banking is impossible, essentially, under a, a Bitcoin system. Um, I, and, and I'm not uh, so sure about that. Uh, and and, and my, my feelings on this follow both from what I think I've seen in history and also from what I, I know in type of the, the theoretical models I write down. Uh, but the basic argument would be something like this. I mean, uh, you, know, um, you know, I think Robert's, one of Robert's arguments is, is like, look, in the old days, maybe fractional reserve banking made sense because what would happen is you'd have these banks issuing paper banknotes redeemable in gold. And the reason why it was useful to have banknotes is because gold has some undesirable properties. I mean, to, to move gold from New York to San Francisco, you'd have to hire Wells Fargo and a stagecoach and all the security. I mean, it's really, really difficult to, to transport gold, to assay gold, you know, to keep gold secure. And for that reason, there may have been a role for these uh, intermediaries called banks to kind of monetize that goal in the, in the form of paper notes redeemable in the gold. Uh, um, but, um, and, and Robert might argue, one argument he has is, you know, today, Bitcoin is not like, it's kind of like gold, but it's like digital gold. It's like if I want to send uh, digital gold from New York to, to San Francisco, there's, there's none of these issues. And, and, and so why do we need a bank to kind of intermediate this, this, this Bitcoin stuff when it's already such a great kind of payment object. My argument on that is, is well, one property of Bitcoin is that it's, uh, it doesn't earn any interest, right? You don't earn interest sure. on your Bitcoin. Now, yes. you might earn some capital gains if the purchasing power goes up. And uh, you, know, you might earn some capital losses as this purchasing power goes down, but you don't earn any interest on it. So it's a zero interest bearing asset. Um, which is okay, but that's just the fact. It's a zero interest bearing asset. Now, banks are still going to be motivated, I think, to go out and say, you know, the way the banking system works is they could imagine a world where, where Bitcoin is kind of the unit of account and the base money. Banks could still, you know, I'll go up to the bank and say, can you lend me a, a million Bitcoins? I've got a business, a restaurant business I want to finance. And what the bank does is, even if it has just uh, 100,000 Bitcoins in its possession, it could just issue me those Bitcoins on account. I mean, that's how demand deposit, that's how the banking system works. It just, in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the act of making the loan, it actually creates uh, Bitcoin denominated liabilities uh, that are redeemable on demand for the limited amount of Bitcoin reserves it has but are, are, are otherwise constitute uh, legal claims against the bank. But who, who would accept those? I mean, if, if I was like now uh, maybe a supplier and I mean, I wouldn't give, I, I certainly wouldn't treat those uh, at parity. Well, suppose I offered you 5% uh, return on, on, on your deposits held with me. Suppose that. Suppose that you felt, uh, you know, we're in a period of economic uh, tranquility, the economy's kind of 
moving along, humming along, you know, banks are doing well. Um, but that's a, it's a bit like a pyramid scheme, no? I mean, then... No, not, a, not at all, because the, what the bank is doing is investing in my business. I'm generating 10% profit for the bank. The bank takes 5% and pays the depositors. In the meantime, people are using the bank liabilities as payments. You say, who would do it? My friend, we're doing it today. We use these bank, this bank money today all the time. And, and moreover, even even before FDIC, I mean, people would just use private bank money of exactly this. But, but so so you would so the bank would so you would the bank would have a hundred thousand in in bitcoins, a hundred thousand bitcoins, and they would give you a million a credit of a million uh, correct uh, bitcoin worth bitcoin. Yep. And now you have obviously they're not bitcoins, right? Like because they don't have those. Correct. So you have this other, I don't know, maybe another cryptocurrency, another ledger. Maybe it's tracked on another ledger, right? Yeah, on the bank's ledger, just like it is. On today. the bank's ledger. And then uh, you would want to pay someone else and they would say, uh, okay. But I mean, for me, for example, now you have a million Bitcoins. Uh, if I wanted to, I, I mean, I would never be willing, for example, to accept more than 10%, right? What if you gave me 110,000? I mean, if I went to the bank, they wouldn't be able to give it to me. That's, that's correct, but they could just sell off the loan uh, to acquire it. Uh, you know, they, might, they, they, they have assets on their balance sheet that constitutes a loan against my business. They could sell off that security to some other bank to acquire the Bitcoin they need to, to meet the redemption request. The other thing we have to be careful is, is um, when you say, I wouldn't do this, I'm sure that you would, but the question is, is, here's the question. If banks were to offer such a product, would there be people out there, agents or agencies that would be willing to accept these bank liabilities and treat them at close to par with the actual base money, the Bitcoin or the gold or the US dollar? And the overwhelming evidence shows us that not only people, people are more than willing, even for small, you know, this, this is the reach for yield phenomenon. Even for small uh, gains in yield, they're willing to substitute into these types of liabilities. And it, we saw this in the shadow banking sector. We saw this, uh, you know, people had the option of when they wanted to deposit, say, $500 million overnight, that they could take a U.S. Treasury as collateral for this loan. But instead, you know, they're going, you know what, why should I take this... Uh, uh, this this uh, U.S. Treasury, I mean, maybe this AAA rated tranche of mortgage backed security, which earns a slightly higher yield, is kind of like a, is like a better product or something. Uh, you know, you, see, you kind of saw this kind of reach for yield phenomenon in the shadow banking sector. And it, it, it's just kind of a phenomenon that seems unavoidable, that, that especially during periods of, um, of uh, tranquility, um, you know, uh, they see that they go, oh, you know, I, I've, I've used the bank. I've used my bank account uh, for the past five years. It's, everything seems to be working well. Uh, now I have the option of holding my money in the form of zero interest bearing Bitcoin or 3% uh, uh, bear, interest bearing account at a, at a well-established and reputable uh, chartered bank. Which am I going to pick? I'm telling you, people are, people are going to be willing to hold these bank liabilities and it's going to generate a system of fractional reserve banking, I think. So is this, so the question is, is this desirable? I mean, you mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago that if you, we were to get rid of fractional reserve banking, that would be for the benefit of humanity. It, it, would it be desirable to fall back into this system of, uh, that can essentially implode at, at some point? Well, I have to be careful. I did, I, I actually, the, the, in the theoretical models I work with, there's, there's actually benefits to fractional reserve banking. Uh, there's kind of costs and benefits. So I, I wouldn't go so far to say that I'd be in favor of banning it. The real issue with fractional reserve banking or, or, or what we see these behavior in the shadow banking sector is this, um, is this, uh, you know, to, to, to what extent are the people who partake in these activities, to what extent do they have, uh, are they going to be bailed out by the public? That, that's the issue. Okay. And um, 
so, you know, one school of thought says, well, let fractional reserve banking have its way, let it go, just as long as people understand that uh, if and when such a system kind of, uh, uh, you know, subject to a run or if, if, if there's some, some sort of losses to be incurred, that, uh, that the depositors will take responsibility on their own for these losses. They have to understand the risks and, and not be, uh, uh, and not be uh, expecting some sort of government bailout. Um, my view on this is, uh, is if, if, if the government could commit not to bail out pe people or certain groups of people in these types of traumatic events, then, uh, yeah, fractional reserve banking uh, or any other type of financial structure, I mean, let it fly. I mean, I think that, you know, these, these institutions, these structures exist presumably for a reason. People are, should be free to trade. They should be free to contract with each other. And if these are the designs that they, they find, uh, uh, they find uh, useful for their own purpose, let them go ahead and do it. But my, 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 my more cynical side says, we, ju we just, the government does not have that ability well, yeah. to commit not to bail out you know, it, in these events. And, and, and it's, 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 it's that yeah. government inability to prevent itself from, from bailing out is, is kind of what leads to the troubles. It certainly can make a very credible claim that it's never going to bail uh, the right. banks out in the <laughs> financial right. crisis. Right. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to come back to uh, what we were mentioning a while ago about um, the, the uh, sort of the strength of the U.S. dollar and the advantage that the U.S. would have if they were to, if this Fed coin were ever to become a reality. Because by the way, this is all theoretical. This is just thought experiments. <laughs> That's right. Um, so. You know, let's let's say this. The you know, the, there's a Fed coin, and it starts being used, uh, presumably by you know for international trade as well as uh, as the currency to trade like oil and uh, commodities, and also starts being used in countries where you know the currency is not as strong. Um, could could we then this like and then okay, so for example, the uh, you know the European Commission or the um, uh, the European Union, rather, also does their coin, and then you ha start having these competitions between coins. And then, can can we assume that in sort of a macroeconomic scenario, uh, one coin will maybe like one or two coins will become the de facto coins that everybody is using? Because you know, if like Zimbabwe starts doing their coin, like who's going to use that if they can just use the U.S. dollar and it's as easy to use as cash? Well, that's right. So uh, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, who knows how this uh, such a system might evolve? I mean, my my best guess would you, you'd see. I mean, I think hi history provides us some guide as to what's likely to happen because you know th th what you're describing is is not new. This phenomenon of currency competition of multiple currencies. Take a look at the system as it exists today. We do have a few dominant currencies around the world, right? The U.S. dollar, the yen, the euro. I mean, these are dominant. Uh, a lot of international pricing and international trade is, is done in, in, in U.S. dollars. Uh, but at the same time, even, even within the United States, we see, uh, you know, what people aren't aware of is we, we, we see thousands of local currencies coexisting. You know, the, the Ithaca Hour in Ithaca, New York is kind of a prominent example. Uh, so... Uh, it is it is conceivable that you'll have this system of, of uh, where you have a, a few uh, dominant currencies coexisting with a, a, a plethora of, of of local currencies. I mean, that's what history suggests is likely to happen. I mean, I think also one one important thing uh, to consider, sort of when thinking about this, and, and I think that's something that is really radically changing with cryptocurrencies is that there is no reason anymore that national boundaries are respected, right? Because, I mean, in the past, uh, and, and, you know, still for the most part today, but the, a currency is very much like embedded in the financial system and the banks, and that's regulated and controllable by the government. But when that starts breaking apart, well, then it, I think it's extremely hard to... to tell how it's going to turn out, but I think it will be, it will be very interesting. And, and yeah, I guess that idea that of competition between currencies is a, it's a very old idea and it will be, I guess it's, it's never, it's never sort of fully come to fruition, right? But I it think might that, now. Yeah. And, uh, 
in terms of like the uh, you know people living in in some jurisdictions like uh, actually I just heard that Ecuador was uh, is pegging its its cryptocurrency to the U.S. dollar. You know you you look at the look what's happening in Venezuela today as well. Um, I think that the available uh, availability of, of a Bitcoin-like object, uh, or, or if it was Fedcoin or Bitcoin or whatever, is 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 potentially a great boon to the uh, the people who are living in these jurisdictions because it can free themselves from. I mean, this this, this like Venezuela is what I, I would call kind of an example of kind of not a well-managed monetary system, and it inflicts a great deal of pain on the on the local population, and the the ability to free themselves of this mismanaged uh, fiscal and monetary authority, I think would be a great benefit to uh, the people who live in these types of places. Today's magic word is money, M-O-N-E-Y. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Can we talk about perhaps uh, some of the sort of more technical aspects of what this would look like? So we were discussing this earlier and curious in your idea of how a Fedcoin would work, like would there be mining, for instance? Would it be a fully decentralized system or uh, would, be, be, would we be relying on centralized nodes? Um, I'm sure our listeners would be familiar with technologies like Hyperledger and other um, more or Ripple, for instance. Uh, how, would that, how would that play out? Yeah, so I, I'm not an expert in the, the technical aspects here, but like I, I suggested at the very beginning, uh, you know, th- those are details that could kind of be worked out, and it, it'd be kind of important because, um, you know, at one extreme, uh, you could just dispense with these uh, uh, miners altogether and just, you know, I mean, why not just trust the Fed to kind of uh, do the... Uh, yeah, the a central right? database. Huh? Hmm? I didn't hear yeah, that. just a central database, right? Yeah, just a, it's just, it, it, it could even be a public ledger. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's nothing that prevents it from being a public ledger, uh, you know. And, and the the identities of people's uh, uh, of, dent, of, their, of them and their accounts may or may not be made public. You know, I mean, there's so many parameters. But at the end of the day, at one extreme, you could just imagine the the Fed managing the bookkeeping, and it, and and that system would be extremely cheap really cheap relative to, say, a Bitcoin protocol, which consumes vast quantities of uh, electricity, for example, we know. No, I agree. Now, but, uh, but if we presume that it's a centralized system uh, with just a central database, like there's, so there's some issues with that. And so we can look at it from the perspective that we want to have an open system or a more closed system. And if you have a, a central database then you run into some issues like uh, censorship. So, you know, some countries may like all out block uh, DNS requests, like requests to the central uh, database at the Fed and making it impossible to use uh, that currency in those countries. Um, so, but then there is also sort of the in between where you could have a semi decentralized system with semi trusted nodes uh a bit of, you know, like all around the world that are operated by the Fed and are run peer to peer, where you would ha- you know you trust those nodes because they are run by the Fed, but you don't have uh, this sort of like one central server uh, that can be um, right. uh, censored by by certain countries. Correct. Right, mm. and you could have uh, the 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 Bitcoin uh, the Fed Bitcoin the Fed coin component. In my blog post, I liken Fed coin as to as as the issuance of just a, a different denomination of currency. I think it would be conceivable to have that part of the money supply uh, exist on a distributed ledger, right? So just the way Bitcoin is today. The only difference is, is that the Fed would stand ready to uh, enforce a par exchange rate against uh, Fed coin and regular U.S. dollars. And, and that would have the benefit of eliminating the exchange rate volatility. Uh, and, then, and then at the other extreme, you're asking at the other extreme, you could imagine the Fed just delegating uh, the responsibility of uh, clearing the Fedcoin request using some third party like uh, uh, like the Bitcoin miners at, at the at one extreme, or, or or you can imagine some intermediate system, kind of like a Ripple Ripple protocol. I mean, the 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 possibilities are endless. I mean, it'd be I don't know which would be the best way to do it. 
And one, one other possibility that the Fed could just buy PayPal and start using that as their <laughs> central <laughs> payment system. I mean, they, they've got a, a good system in place that's used by a lot of people. So why not just do yeah. that now? Well, <laughs> well, indeed, I mean, PayPal could actually, if, if um, you know, if, if, the, if the federal government, we have to be careful, right? We don't want to confuse the Fed with the federal government. A lot of people of make that mistake. Maybe we should, like, be clear up front. The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States is not the federal government. Um, it's it's the uh, it's the central bank that was created out of an act of Congress in 1913. Just uh, uh, so so what was the question? So uh, the I, I lost it there. Sorry, guys. Um, I, I lost it in my. Uh, uh, we were talking about the uh, PayPal. Uh, oh yeah, buying I was saying PayPal. Pay, pay, PayPal at present is is uh, you know they're prohibited from doing a lot of stuff, right? I mean, if PayPal could, I suppose that they would be willing to offer kind of like a, a pseudonymous uh, Swiss bank, you know, Swiss style bank accounts, for example. Why couldn't you do something like that? I mean, they're, they're, they're prohibited from doing that. But I mean, you know, if if uh, so, a lot of this technology exists out there already, like PayPal could do all of this stuff. And uh, it's just what's 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 preventing them from doing it is the existing body of legislation, obviously. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is um, it's very fascinating to think uh, where this all can go. I think especially, and, and, and that's, that's a direction that seems inevitable to me, that there will be a lot of currencies competing with each other with different features, different protocols. Uh, and that's, that's going to be a very novel world, you know, I mean. Well, like the Bitcoin, uh, not Bitcoin, the Ripple protocol is actually, they, they, they sell it as kind of more of a currency agnostic system. So, so one does have to make a distinction, I think, between the currency and actually the payment system, you know, how you actually affect payment. So the, the, the Bitcoin is both, of course. Bitcoin is both a money and a payment system. It, it, it has the, uh, the currency unit. It manages the supply of the currency unit. And it is a protocol that affects transfers of, 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 of value across accounts. Uh, Ripple is Ripple can can uh, can you know in principle operate without uh, its native currency. I think. I mean, it's 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 more of a, a, a protocol designed to affect transfers of, of value that that don't depend on 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 the the actual uh, uh, management of the supply of a native currency. I yeah, just think absolutely. it's important to distinct make a distinction between the creation and management of a, a money supply and the protocol in place for affecting uh, uh, transfers of the value across accounts. Yeah, absolutely. No, no. We may have just a few or one, maybe even a uh, way of transferring value, but then there yeah, might right, be all right. kinds of currencies right. on top of it. Um, so this is probably going to be a, a difficult question for you, but I'm, I'm curious anyway. So we've, we've been talking a lot about these sort of interesting scenarios for the future. And what do you think the probability is or the time frame that maybe the Federal Reserve or some other um, central bank or government in the world will, will do something like that? Oh, so I think that, um, you know, the big, big players like the Federal Reserve, you know the EMU. I mean, they're probably going to be relatively slow. I think where where you're going to see the 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 innovative attempts occur is kind of like smaller smaller countries, smaller jurisdictions. And in fact, I I think you're already kind of seeing that in some countries. I think I just mentioned uh, Ecuador, for example. That if if I I didn't read the article uh, uh, in in depth, but it it sounded like in Ecuador, for example, uh, what they're doing is issuing their their own cryptocurrency. Uh, with the property that it's it's going to be uh, uh, evidently backed by the U.S. dollar, uh, so you can kind of uh, expect, I think, these types of innovations to occur kind of at the fringes, these small countries, and and these experiments will will take place. Economists and other people will observe the outcomes, and uh, you know if something good comes out of it, if it's if it becomes a, an obviously dominant sort of. Uh, institutional arrangement, then at, at that point, you can kind of expect, uh, you know, larger players to kind of develop kind of the best uh, policies that, uh, that, that have worked out well in these experiments. Um, and at the same time, you can expect, though, 
it's not like the Fed is or, or the big banks or the big money services businesses, you know, MasterCard, PayPal, um, you know, Western Union. The, these agents, the, they're not standing still in time. They, they're, they're continually innovating as well. And, um, and so it's not going to be clear <laughs> what, how it's going to all happen. I think the only thing I'm really confident of is that uh, the trend that we've seen in, uh, so far in terms of the uh, advancements in, in the payment system are going to continue in the future. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that is, I think, instructive along this dimension for your listeners is to just think about, for those of you who are old enough, just think about how difficult it was to affect payments even just, uh, you know, in, in the 1970s. You know, so I, I, I tell a story uh, that when, when my mother took me to Italy in 1971, uh, I was just a, a 10 year old kid at the time, but I remember distinctly, she had to go and get traveler's checks, right? We had to go to the local office. We had to find it, you know, through the yellow pages, not on the internet. You had to go and drive and, 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 and then you had to pay a fee to get these traveler's checks. You had to take this traveler's checks to Italy. Uh, and then, you know, my uncle would, dr we'd have to find a local uh, office for, for American Express. I mean, we'd have to drive 100 kilometers to get to that office. Maybe that office was open. Maybe it wasn't open. Then you'd pay another fee to kind of uh, convert it into the lira. And then, you know, you'd want to do a, a big chunk because you didn't want to be carrying it, uh, do it all, all the time. And uh, when I went to Frankfurt just earlier this year, I didn't take any cash. I flew there with my credit card. That, that was it, you know? So for, for people who are complaining about how the payment system is working today, I got you. You know, I understand. We all wish it kind of would work better. There's obviously, uh, there's room for improvement. But we're, you know, don't, don't just take a static view of it. I mean, we've, we've come a long way. There's been a lot of innovation, a lot of progression. And I think what we have to expect is that these innovations are going to continue into the future. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I mean, I, sorry, Brian, um, I, I agree. And I think that in, in the next 10, 10, 20 years, we'll see the same sort of innovation in, in that in the payment system that we've seen uh, in other sectors uh, like like biotech, like uh, like, you know, the content business um, and that the financial sector is 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 now going to see some radical changes and and will be disrupted by these technologies. And, yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, for sure. and and just to just to you know to you know we we were not talking about timeline here, but I just want to point out that David Johnston, uh, a well known uh, Bitcoin uh, angel investor, uh, once came on the show and said that if a government isn't integrating blockchain technology within five to ten years. Not only will they be obsolete, but their currencies will be gone. So that's just something to perhaps end on, and that uh, uh, say to say that we need to get a move on because we only have five to ten years to get this to get this right. <laughs> well, I, uh, I have to I have to caution everybody too. I mean, uh, in in the following sense, I mean, uh, even in that sort of scenario, which I don't think is going to happen, but I mean, you know, a lot a, a lot of this movement, a, a, a significant uh, component of this movement, is kind of motivated by you know. The libertarians, you know, the ones who want to free themselves from the shackles of government uh, money manipulation. The, the one thing, you know, I want to caution people is that it, it, this is not going to, even if it, even if you eliminated government currencies, this is not going to be a solution to that problem of bad governments. I mean, governments can still tax. <laughs> they, they could say, go ahead, go run your blockchain technology. Awesome. Uh, well, we're still going to tax you. In fact, we might even have to tax you more. And, uh, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. So I, I, I'd be, you know, careful in saying, oh, for those people out there who think that somehow this movement to, a, 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 you know, an apolitical currency unit is going to be the end of oppression, um, it, you know, it's not. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, David, thanks so much for joining us today. It was, uh, it was really interesting talking to you, and I think it's a super interesting topic. And yeah, well, I guess well, in a few years, uh, maybe we can, uh, we can do another episode, <laughs> or maybe before that, yeah, and, be and see, uh, see how things have progressed, because I'm sure we'll see a lot of events in this, in this area. It's uh, going to be fun, yeah. It's going to be fun, yes. Uh, so is there some um, point, some place you want to point uh, our listeners to? Uh, we will link to your blog. Uh, definitely oh. in the show notes. Uh, is there some other uh, some other resources or? 
Well, um, let's see. So I, I think Tim Swanson has an excellent blog. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, they're, 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 yeah, you know. So we know him. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not an expert in cryptocurrencies or anything like that. I do blog about it once in a while. So I, I would say if your listeners are kind of uh, interested to see a central banker's perspective and how uh, his views are evolving over time on the subject, I, I do intend to post. Uh, something on this notion that we talked about, about the possibility of fractional reserve banking in a Bitcoin-like world. And, and I'd be interested, you know, if, if your listeners would like to go to my blog, I'd say just monitor my blog and uh, I could potentially point them to, feel, feel, feel free to email me as well, by the way, so. Okay, perfect, well, we'll do that. We'll have uh, links to all, uh, and also the talks we find uh, in the show notes. So David, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it, was a, it was a big pleasure. Thank and, you very um, much. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks to your listener for listening. Uh, we release episodes of Bethlehem the Bitcoin every Monday. You can get the episodes uh, on iTunes. You can get it through your podcast apps on SoundCloud, or you can watch the videos on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash Epicenter BTC. And uh, we will be back next week. Of course, if you appreciate the show, you can always give us a tip. And uh, we look forward to being back then. So until next time. I'm not going to